Hi guys and girls, I'm Reef Man, and today I wanted to tell you about a paper which I came across a little bit ago. Uh, this paper is titled Inducing Broadcast Coral Spawning Ex Pseudo Closed System Mesocosm Design and Husbandry Protocol. So in more normal English, what that means is this team of researchers was able to set up tanks that closely matched wild conditions, mesocosms, and they were able to induce or get stony coral, four different species of stony coral, to spawn, raise the larva, and captively reproduce these corals. The researchers who actually did this, um, their names are Jamie Craggs at the University of Derby in the United Kingdom. He did the science collection, the samples, writing, came up with the ideas and the methodology for the study. And he is at the Horniman Museum and Gardens, also in the UK. You can see him on Twitter at Aquarium Curator. The other authors, we have James Guest from Newcastle University in the UK. He did writing. Michelle Davis at the Horniman Museum and Gardens, um, data collection and samples. Jeremy Simmons, also data collection and samples at the Horniman Museum and Gardens. Um, Ishan Dashti at Triton in Germany did all of their ICP analysis. And Michael Sweet at the University of Derby, also in the UK, uh, helped with writing the paper. This team of scientists, uh, well, um, yeah, scientists, did a study over the course of a little over a year and collected four different species of stony coral. They collected Acropora hyacinthus, Acropora tenius, Acropora millipora, and Acropora microclados. They had 14 hyacinthus, seven uh, tenius, five millipora, and six microclados colonies. They set up tanks to mimic two different reef systems in conditions, a reef in Singapore and a reef in the Great Barrier Reef. They had uh, hyacinthus from Singapore, tenuous from Singapore, millipora and microclados from the Great Barrier Reef. Um, of those, they had 100% spawn rate of the millipora and microclados, 57% of the tenuous, and 29% of the hyacinthus they were able to get to spawn. When they collected these, because uh, they were wild collected specimens, the colonies ranged in size from about four inches to 15 inches. And then they were placed in tanks of their own design and, um, and they waited for them to spawn. Basically, they set up conditions. We'll go through that. So corals spawn on a yearly basis in the wild. So they collected their coral a few months before they would normally spawn, uh, cut samples off of them, and looked at them under a microscope to see what the condition of the gametes in the coral were at the time, to see how far along the, the spawning would be. They found that most of their coral that they got was actually gravid, and so they had to wait some amount of months for the wild spawning to happen in their tank. Um, this gave them a chance to practice collecting the gametes, things like that, but um, also gave them a chance to have the coral completely reset and go through its entire spawning cycle, which takes about a year, in their tank. The annual spawning in Singapore takes place over a period of three to five nights after the first full moon in late March. It's like clockwork. The Great Barrier Reef spawning takes place over uh, or about four to six nights after the first full moon in late October or early November. So the entire reef will spawn at just that moment. So their theory was if they mimic the conditions of the ocean, if they mimic the lighting and the temperature, perhaps they could cause their coral to spawn on the same cycle in the aquarium. And it turns out that you can actually do that. So the team built two different tanks for this research project. Included in their paper were no pictures of the tank. However, there was a diagram that we'll take a look at. 
So these tanks are about seven feet, 10 inches long by about two feet, one inch wide and one foot, seven inches deep. So they're relatively shallow, wide tanks. Of course, the paper gives everything in centimeters, which is why the dimensions in inches are a little bit odd. In centimeters, it's 240 by 65 by 50. These tanks work out to about 780 liters or about 206 gallons in US terms. And this research project was in part sponsored by Ecotech Marine. So they used a lot of Ecotech Marine equipment in the tank, as you might expect. They used a Vectra L1 return pump from a sump, and they had a large sump underneath their tank, uh, which measured 222 centimeters by 62 centimeters by 43 centimeters. So their sump is almost as big as their actual tank, uh, only a few gallons less than their actual display tank. The sump was split into four sections. They had a mechanical filtration section, a refugium, a protein skimmer, and then a return section. This study followed the full Triton method, and so the importance of having a large refugium uh, to have the allergy that the Triton method um, requires is, uh, is important. One interesting thing that we don't do a lot in America here, but um, apparently is more, uh, more common in Europe, um, they used a E200 power roll filter which is a pretty cool thing. I'll link to a video by Bulk Reef Supply. I think that they sell a similar thing. Um, but basically, think of it as a filter sock on a roll. Your water comes through a roll of filter media that is constantly moving slowly. So you never have to worry about gummed up filter socks. You never have to worry about your filter socks overflowing because there's always a fresh part of the material coming in off the roll. In their tank, they also had three different species of culpra and chido, or cato, or chidomorpha, however you want to say that, um, lit by four 54 watt T5 bulbs. So that made up their refugium section. And they ran their lights for the refugium on a reverse schedule, a uh, 12 hour schedule um, opposite the actual tank. They used an ATP protein skimmer. Um, cleaned it daily. They also flushed the airline weekly to prevent salt buildup and the resulting um, drop in efficiency. That's something that I don't do, but um, having read this paper, I, I am actually thinking of flushing my airline more often um, or really ever. Um, it's a good point to think about. I, I've heard about pumps or some, I've heard about skimmers overflowing um, and just you know gumming up and not working, people complain. And it turns out it's just the airline is calcified. So um, maybe think about doing that to your skimmer every once in a while. Just run some RO water down the airline just to flush out anything that might be in there. Um, they also used both activated carbon, carbon, <laughs> activated carbon and also um, GFO in their tank. They had 300 grams of activated carbon and 500 grams of Roafos GFO in their sump as well to handle um, any you know, extra chemicals uh, and also manage the phosphate in the water. They didn't do any sort of specific phosphate testing or regenerating the GFO or anything like that. They actually completely replaced that GFO and carbon every two weeks. So no, um, no constant measurement of, of phosphate, no sodium hydroxide regeneration of the GFO, uh, just in the trash and new GFO every two weeks. Being the Triton method, they didn't have to worry about water changes. Um, in the Triton method, you replenish m missing nutrients sort of individually. You have some base elements that you dose, but you then also dose like selenium separately or iron separately if you need it, and it turns out that you do. Um, they used H2Ocean Pro Salt to begin with for the initial fill, and they matched the initial uh, water conditions to the salinity on the two different reefs that they were, um, that they were studying. Uh, the reef in Singapore and the reef in the Great Barrier Reef have different conditions, and so they, uh, you know, as part of the study, it was important for them to match the conditions, even salinity, very closely. In the tank, they also had 
um, Radeon Gen 4 Pro lights, three different heaters, and also a chiller, because it was important, again, to match the daily seasonal temperature cycle as well. The tank overall was controlled by a Neptune Apex controller into which they programmed daily seasonal variations in temperature and also photo cycle. They used the WXB connector for the, um, for the Equitech Marine uh, equipment that they used and that allowed them to define the intensity and also the length of light that, or the length of photo period in their tank. I did think that it was interesting. They used a lot more radions than uh, I think most of us use, or at least I think that it was. Uh, let me know if you, if you feel otherwise. Um, on my tank, which is slightly larger than theirs, I have six radions. On their tank, they had eight radion XR30 Pros Gen 4. And the reason for so many is because they wanted to match the lux. They didn't do par testing, but they matched the lux at the surface of the water to the conditions at the surface of the water in the reefs that they were replicating. So what they needed to do to, in order to do that was basically one radion per 118 square inches of surface area in their tank. That's a lot less or a lot more radions than what you'll get if you just follow the um, one covers about 24 by 24 or 36 by 36 that radi or that Ecotech will tell you. So that's a, sort of an interesting thing to think about. Um, I am considering maybe adding some more to my tank after this paper came out. So they did a three hour sunrise and a three hour sunset cycle every day but they matched the overall photo period to the amount of time that the sun was in the sky at the reef that they were replicating. They also had to deal with lunar cycles. I think a lot of us are familiar with coral spawning in relation to lunar cycles. And at the beginning of this video, I even mentioned that it's, you know, three to four days after the first full moon in March that the coral spawns. So you have to be able to simulate that full moon. On the market, there are several different kinds of lunar lights. The problem that they found was that the color temperature of the light by those lunar light LED modules is not really at all what you'll actually see if you were to go outside at night and measure the color of the moonlight. So what they had to do was buy lunar lights, take out the blue LEDs and put in their own LEDs, which they got uh, to be 4,150 Kelvin. That's the temperature of moonlight that they used. Um, so that was an interesting sort of customization that they had to do. One thing that I have done uh, after reading this paper is I feed my coral more. You don't think about stony coral as needing to eat necessarily, but Anything that has tentacles, and as we know, all of our stony coral has polyps and those polyps have tentacles. Anything that has things like that is designed to catch food. Yes, it gains a lot of energy from the light and the zoanthella that are in its tissue, but it can gain so much more just by capturing food particles out of the water. And so I feed my coral now about twice a week. They fed their coral actually daily. So to, to feed their coral, what they did was turn off all of their pumps. Well, their sump they turned off. So no flow through the filter sock, no um, protein skimmer was going during this. They turned off their sump for two hours. And during that two hours, they added Acropower marine um, amino acids, baker's yeast, which provides a picoplankton, uh, live tetracelmus, which is a nanoplankton, live artema, which is a microplankton, and dead uh, Brachionis polactilis, which is a mesoplankton. Then, in addition to all of that, they added lobster eggs, fish eggs, and cyclops for the coral to eat. They noted that the tank turned cloudy at the beginning of this two hours, 
but that by the end of the two hours, the water was again clear, which meant that something was eating the food that they had added. Um, since there was no, um, at least they make no mention of live rock or anything like that, we have to imagine that these tanks, or this coral colony was maybe on um, PVC segments or something like that. So there's nothing else in this tank that could be eating um, you know, baker's yeast out of the water other than their coral colonies. So they were pretty sure that the coral was in fact consuming these things. To maintain the algae levels in the tank, they had two tangs, a fox face, a copper band, a butterfly fish, and a yellow and purple wrasse. They also had five red leg hermits, 15 trochus snails, and four urchins per tank. And they had the same setup uh, for the Singapore and for the Great Barrier Reef tank. They found that by taking coral samples from their, or tissue samples from their coral about two months before the expected spawn date, that the coral in their tank was going through its natural reproductive cycle. They were able to see microscopically, uh, well, not microscopically, but with a dissection microscope, they were able to see um, gametes being formed in the tissues of the coral. And from that, they could look to see how far along the development was and tune their estimation as to when the spawning would actually happen. Because witnessing the spawning is something that they really wanted to be able to do. At the time when they expected the spawning to happen, which they were messing with the life cycle uh, of their tanks so that the nighttime was actually during the day in the Horniman Museum, so they could actually witness and study the, the spawning event itself. Um, but the time that they estimated the spawning to happen, they turned off all their pumps 30 minutes before the spawning. And then that meant that the gametes, the um, reproductive uh, like sperm and eggs, things like that, would float up from the coral because there's no water movement to push them anywhere else. And they were able to actually witness the spawning in their tanks. In order to get the coral to spawn, it was important for them to tightly control the available light in the tank. So they needed to ha basically have blackout curtains and devices all around the, the system so that the coral would not see any light other than the light given off by their radions and their lunar lights. They were able to rear the larva that they collected from the surface of the water all the way through to other uh, small polyps on the uh, hard surfaces of their larval tank. And I thought it was really amazing to see the larva of these corals actually swimming around. You don't think of um, you know, Acropora millipora or Acropora hyacinth, you think of them as these um, you know, pretty stationary animals. Yes, they move around a little bit, they sway in the water, their polyps do, but um, they don't swim around. But it turns out that as larvae, they actually do swim around. They're not just floating around on the currents, they're motile, they uh, are able to seek out food and, um, and move around, which I thought was really interesting. And they provided video in their paper under the additional documents uh, that I, I'm showing you guys uh, to see what that looks like. And they were able to rear those larva all the way to juvenile coral colonies, which I thought was super amazing. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. Uh, let me know what you thought. I did want to show you guys this because I think it really is an example of a slightly different way of running an aquarium, but one that obviously the coral did well at. And so I wanted to maybe bring some of the points that they um, that they used for their success into my own tank and with hopes that I would have similar success. I'm not going to try to, you know, fake any lunar cycles or, or anything like that, but um, the, their use of the Triton method, I think, is interesting. I've seen a lot of good things about the Triton method, and I haven't really heard anything bad about it. And so that's something that I'm really interested in trying out uh, once they get their sort of like stock issues figured out. Um, they also kept really tight control of their uh, water temperature. 
but it swung all the way, swung all the way from you know, mid 70s to low mid 80s over the course of the year. Um, that won't work in our tanks, obviously, because I have a mix of species of coral from all over the place. But if you were doing a Great Barrier Reef tank, say, you might think about more closely matching the individual conditions that they're used to over the course of a year with defined seasons in your light and temperature. I also thought that it was interesting that they fed their coral every single day. Um, I don't know that I can do that really uh, without having an allergy explosion, um, but you might think about doing it, especially if you're not feeding your coral at all right now. Um, certainly something to consider at least. And then the amount of light that they are providing, I think was also really interesting. I think that the, again, eight radions um, over a, a tank, which was um, seven feet long by two feet wide. So that's um, you know, a relatively long but thin tank, and they had eight radions over that amount of, of space. Um, it's definitely something to consider in your tank. Maybe you can add some light. Um, that would definitely help with shadowing off of the corals, uh, things like that. So again, let me know what you thought. The link to the paper is down below. Feel free to also subscribe to the Twitter account. Uh, it's Aquarium Curator. There's a link below as well. And I hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. Bye.